For decades, the Soviet Union believed it understood the battlefield better than anyone else. In every war game, every training cycle, and every doctrinal manual, one assumption appeared again and again. The tank was king. Armored divisions, fast, heavy, and overwhelming, were the backbone of Soviet power. And behind them, Mi-24 Hind helicopters acted not as precision hunters but as flying infantry transports and gunships, built to charge straight into the fight with brute force. So when the United States unveiled the H-64 Apache in the mid-1980s, Soviet helicopter crews were unimpressed. To them, it looked like another Western luxury machine. Too complicated, too delicate, too dependent on electronics that they believed would fail in the chaos of real combat. Many even joked that the Apache was a fragile camera with wings, a night vision toy unsuited for the harsh demands of mechanized warfare. But those laughs were rooted in a doctrine decades old. The Soviet playbook was built around mass, hundreds of vehicles, deep battle thrusts, overwhelming firepower. Soviet pilots were trained to support ground columns, not stalk enemy armor from hidden angles. Their confidence came from experience. In Afghanistan, Heinz absorbed small arms fire, RPG hits, even 12.7 mm rounds, and often limped back to base with chunks of tail fins missing. They saw their aircraft as flying tanks, and assumed anything lighter or more electronic would simply break. What they did not fully understand was the revolution happening inside NATO throughout the 1970s and 1980s. After the Yom Kippur War demonstrated that guided missiles could shred armored formations, Western doctrine quietly shifted. Instead of matching Soviet numbers, NATO focused on precision, sensors, and night fighting dominance. At the center of that shift was the idea of an attack helicopter designed not to charge into enemy fire, but to disappear into the terrain, rise for a split second, fire a missile from beyond visual range, and vanish before the enemy even registered the threat. And that shift led directly to the Apache. By the late Cold War, U.S. planners weren't thinking about helicopter dogfights or frontal assaults. They were designing a machine built to break the spine of a Soviet armored offensive before dawn. And as intelligence reports began to filter eastward, Soviet helicopter crews slowly realized something unsettling. This new aircraft wasn't playing the same game they were. The first signs of trouble appeared not in Europe, but in the classified reports coming out of U.S. training ranges. Soviet analysts monitoring NATO exercises noticed something unusual. Helicopter units were no longer flying predictable, high-altitude approaches. Instead, they were vanishing into folds of terrain, hugging the ground so closely that radar could barely distinguish them from the earth beneath. This tactic, nap of the earth flight, was far more refined than anything Soviet pilots practiced. Hind crews relied on armor and firepower to survive. Apache crews relied on invisibility. Then came the real shock. In the early 1980s, American aviation brigades began performing nighttime live-fire exercises that seemed impossible to Soviet observers. Using thermal imaging and night vision systems, Apache prototypes struck targets at ranges where Soviet helicopters couldn't even identify a silhouette. More troubling, the Americans were firing from behind ridgelines, treelines, and defilades, places where no aircraft should logically have a clear line of fire. Only after careful analysis did Soviet intelligence grasp what they were seeing. The Americans were using mass-mounted sensors and stabilized FLIR systems to create firing solutions without exposing the helicopter itself. That single capability overturned decades of Soviet assumptions. The Hind, for all its armor, had to expose nearly its entire fuselage to deliver weapons. The Apache did the opposite, revealing only a sensor and then vanishing again. For the first time, the Soviets faced an aircraft designed to fight in a dimension they had virtually ignored. Complete darkness. Their own night attack capabilities were limited, relying heavily on illumination rounds or visible spectrum equipment that exposed their position. The Apache, however, thrived in darkness. It was built around it. This shift in capability forced planners in Moscow to consider a scenario they had previously dismissed. What if NATO attack helicopters could break up an armored breakthrough before it even reached the forward line? A formation of Heinz could be spotted, tracked, and engaged long before they reached missile range. And an armored regiment pushing through the Fulda Gap, once assumed to be unstoppable, could find itself ambushed by aircraft it never saw. These unsettling possibilities spread quietly through the Soviet aviation community, 
and seasoned crews began privately expressing concerns. The Apache wasn't a rival gunship meant to duel the hind. It was a hunter designed to dismantle Soviet doctrine itself, and that made it far more dangerous than any single weapon system the USSR had encountered. The more Soviet analysts studied the Apache, the more disturbing the picture became. The aircraft's strength wasn't its armor, though its survivability was impressive. It wasn't its speed, though it could outrun older gunships in a sprint. What alarmed them most was the weapon that defined the Apache's mission, the AGM-114 Hellfire. Unlike earlier anti-tank missiles that required operators to guide the weapon all the way to impact, the Hellfire used a precise laser designation system that allowed the missile to steer itself in the final phase. For Soviet planners accustomed to older Western missiles with limited penetration, this was a turning point. In simulations, the Hellfire consistently defeated the frontal armor of T-64s, T-72s, and even the upgraded T-80 variants. Tests showed that the missile could be ripple-fired at multiple targets within seconds, allowing a single Apache section to eliminate an entire tank platoon before the Soviet vehicles could close the distance. Worse, the missile's range, often sighted at 8 kilometers, allowed Apaches to engage armor formations from well beyond the reach of Soviet helicopter-mounted weapons. In practice, an Apache could destroy a hind before the hind's crew even realized it was being painted. But it wasn't simply the missile that alarmed the Soviets, it was the way the Apache used it. U.S. doctrine emphasized coordinated strikes using multiple aircraft firing from dispersed positions, then retreating into cover before counterfire could be organized. Combined with real-time battlefield intelligence networks, the Apache became a node in a larger kill chain. Soviet officers realized this meant NATO forces could mass firepower without massing aircraft, precisely the opposite of how Soviet attack aviation operated. This doctrinal mismatch created a new kind of vulnerability for Soviet units. Their helicopters were trained to rely on speed and aggression to suppress air defenses. Apaches required neither. They could wait silently on the far side of a ridge, unseen, then rise just long enough to launch missiles at targets kilometers away. Radar often failed to pick them up due to terrain masking, and infrared detection struggled against their cold exhaust signature and disciplined low-power loiter patterns. By the mid-1980s, it was becoming clear to Soviet planners that they faced not just a superior missile or a better helicopter, but an entirely different philosophy of warfare one that turned their own strengths into liabilities. And the final proof of this shift arrived when the first operational Apache units deployed to Europe, where their nighttime exercises quickly confirmed the worst fears circulating within the Soviet helicopter corps. When the first Apache battalions arrived in West Germany, Soviet military attaches and Warsaw Pact observers watched closely. They expected another American showpiece, something impressive in demonstrations but limited in real combat value. Instead, what they witnessed over the next two years fundamentally altered their assessment of NATO's defensive posture. The Apache wasn't just performing well in training. It was rewriting the very nature of helicopter warfare in the Central European theater. Soviet analysts noted that U.S. aviation brigades trained almost exclusively for nighttime engagements. Some units reportedly conducted 70 to 80 percent of their flight hours after dusk, an operational pace unheard of in the Warsaw Pact. In exercises simulating a Soviet armored breakthrough, Apaches routinely moved to pre-designated hide sites at sunset, using terrain masking to avoid detection. Hours later, they would reappear miles from their original positions, launching coordinated hellfire volleys on mock columns from multiple angles before slipping back into darkness. For Soviet crews accustomed to daylight-centered operations or illuminated night flights, this level of stealth-based mobility was deeply unsettling. What alarmed Moscow further was NATO's growing mastery of battlefield integration. The Apache did not operate alone. It was fed by early warning radars, ground reconnaissance teams, electronic intelligence stations, and even the emerging Joint Stars concept. With these inputs, Apache units knew where Soviet armored thrusts were expected, which routes were vulnerable, and which choke points offered the best ambush opportunities. Soviet officers realized that even before the first missile left the rail, their armored spearheads could be tracked and prioritized for attack. The contrast with the hind became unavoidable. The Mi-24 was a rugged, powerful machine, but it was built for direct engagement and troop delivery, not silent hunting. It required exposure to deliver weapons effectively, 
and its avionics offered limited situational awareness compared to the Apache's integrated sensor suite. This meant Soviet helicopter crews entering a contested zone might do so blind, unaware that an Apache flight had already positioned itself along a likely approach corridor hours earlier. Critically, exercises showed that NATO intended to deploy Apaches not as scattered defensive assets but as concentrated strike groups capable of halting entire regiments. Soviet war planners, who had long banked on overwhelming speed and mass, saw in these drills the emergence of a weapon that could erode a mechanized attack before it even reached the front. The final realization was unavoidable. The Apache wasn't merely a gunship. It was the centerpiece of a highly coordinated anti-armor ecosystem, one increasingly optimized to defeat Soviet doctrine itself. By the late 1980s, the implications were clear to anyone inside the Soviet helicopter community who studied NATO's evolving capabilities. If a conflict broke out in Central Europe, the Apache would not meet them head-on. It would not circle above columns like the Hind, nor duel openly at mid-range. Instead, it would emerge from darkness, precise, coordinated, and nearly invisible, delivering crippling strikes before Soviet aircraft or armor had the chance to react. And as more real-world data accumulated, especially from conflicts involving Western helicopters and modern missile systems, the seriousness of this threat became impossible to dismiss. What truly shifted Soviet perceptions, however, was the expanding evidence of how the Apache operated under real combat conditions. The most revealing came from 1991, when Iraq's Soviet-supplied armored units faced coalition forces equipped with Apaches during Operation Desert Storm. Though the Soviet Union was already collapsing, its military observers were still watching closely. Iraq's armored corps fielded tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and air defenses derived directly from Soviet designs. In theory, this equipment should have withstood or at least hindered helicopter attacks. Instead, the opposite occurred. On the opening night of the air campaign, Apaches spearheaded the strike on Iraqi early warning sites. Flying at extremely low altitude in near-total darkness, they navigated obstacles and radar nets with a level of precision Soviet analysts had long questioned. The assault succeeded with stunning effectiveness. Radar installations critical to Iraq's integrated air defense system were destroyed within minutes. For Soviet helicopter crews, this was the first unmistakable demonstration of Apache-led. Night-oriented suppression operations carried out exactly as NATO planners had envisioned them in Europe. But it was the subsequent destruction of Iraqi armored formations that left the strongest impression. Apache gunships hunted T-55s and T-72s at night, striking from standoff ranges and then fading back into the desert with minimal losses. Thermal imagery captured the moment missiles tore into tank turrets, igniting ammunition racks and sending fireballs skyward. Soviet crews studying this footage recognized not simply the defeat of Iraqi armor, but the exposure of their own vulnerabilities. The T-72s destroyed on the outskirts of Kuwait City were the same tanks that formed the backbone of Soviet armored divisions. And the air defenses that failed to stop the Apaches' man-portable missiles, radar-guided guns, and infrared sensors were the same systems Soviet helicopter regiments relied upon for support. This was the nightmare scenario Soviet pilots had quietly feared. An aircraft capable of identifying, engaging, and erasing targets that should have been safe under cover of darkness. The Hind had always been valued for its ruggedness, for its ability to absorb damage and push through defenses. But ruggedness did nothing against a weapon system designed to kill from beyond detection. No amount of armor could protect a helicopter from an attack it never saw coming. In the end, the laughter that Soviet crews once directed at the Apache reflected a doctrine rooted in an earlier era an era in which speed, mass, and sheer firepower were the decisive factors. The Apache belonged to a new era, one defined by sensors, precision, night dominance, and networked warfare. It did not challenge Soviet helicopter crews to a fair fight. It changed the terms of the fight entirely. And as the Cold War came to its close, one truth had become unavoidable across every analysis division in the Soviet Air Force. In the darkness over Central Europe, it would not have been the hind hunting the Apache. It would have been the Apache hunting them. If you're enjoying these deep historical breakdowns, make sure to like the video and subscribe for more Cold War and military history stories every week.